life, we must mer merge the act with life and family worship. Does that make sense? Am I, am, are, I mean, is it making sense? Yes, sir. So that is, you know, what we're talking about in terms of theology of worship. So let's talk about how it looks like in the context of marriage. How does this look in the context of marriage? How does it look in the context of family? We, we've set this foundation. We've talked about um, how these acts and this life has to merge and play out, uh, has to merge in order for it to be true. So how does it play out in the context of marriage? Well, to speak concisely about it, the acts of life and, and, and the acts and the life of worship play out in marriage and family when marriages and family are and families are consistently reflecting God as the object of their highest devotion and allegiance. When, when families and marriages are consistently reflecting that God is the object of their highest devotion and allegiance. That's the, the essence of family worship. In other words, when people look at that family, they know beyond a shadow of a doubt that God is king. They don't have to, they, it's not, it's not, uh, I want to thank the Lord who's ahead of my life. Uh, yeah, okay. Show me that the Lord is ahead of your life. Don't talk about it. Show me. Reflect it. So that when you look at me, you say, oh, yeah, that, that, that's king there. I don't know about anything else, but I know that Jesus is king in that home. That is the essence of family worship. That's where it's produced, and that's where it thrives. So turn, turn to 1 Peter 3. I'm glad they referred to it. Uh, turn to 1 Peter 3, uh, chapter 1. I mean, uh, verse 1. And let's, look, let's look at that particular text. My wife will jump in when she feels like it, so she's a, she's a reserved soul, <laughs> but she's a wise soul, a very, very wise soul. Um, so 1 Peter 3, everybody have, everybody have some scriptures with you? Good deal. Okay. Let's look at verses 1. Again, we're talking about worship, family worship, and a couple that worships God and thus reflects that he is the object of their highest allegiance and highest devotion, they do it through several different ways. Um, um, let me first find my first Peter. Okay. First Peter chapter 3. Let's look at verse 1. Likewise, wives, be subject to your own husbands, so that even if some do not obey the word, they may be warned without a word by the conduct of their wives. When they see your respectful and pure conduct. Do not let your adorning be external, the braiding of hair and the putting on of gold jewelry or the clothing you wear, but let your adorning be the hidden person of the heart with the imperishable beauty of a gentle and quiet spirit, which in God's sight is very precious. But this is how the holy women who hoped in God used to adorn themselves, by submitting to their own husbands as Sarah obeyed Abraham, calling him Lord, and you are her children if you do good and do not fear anything that is frightening. Likewise, husbands, live with your wives in an understanding way, showing honor to the woman as the weaker vessel, since they are heirs with you of the grace of life, so that your prayers may not be hindered. So, we see a couple of thoughts here. We see a couple of thoughts here. Uh, what do we see? Well, we see, first and foremost, we see that God is linking something. Peter is linking something. He's making a linkage between conduct of the wife, and what? The winning of her husband to God. Her conduct and the winning of her husband to God. He says, uh, wives, be subject to your own husbands. Submit to your own husbands. And then he says, show your husbands respect. Wives, be, wives do what? Wives submit to your own husbands. When they see your respectful and pure conduct, they may be one. So submit. And show husbands what? Respect and display what? Purity. Amen? Amen. And so there's, there's certain things that we're seeing here. We're seeing respect, we're seeing submissiveness, and we're seeing purity. Both internal and external purity. In other words, purity in display as well as purity in heart. Now some of you are saying, you know, and, and you know people that say this, well that won't work. Right? <laughs> 
Just because, just because I submit, just because I'm pure, and just because I show some respect, they're going to they come to God now, huh? That ain't going to work. That's nonsense. But here's the, here's, the, here's the thing that I want you to understand clearly. It's not about whether it'll work or not. You understand? It's not obey for it's pragmatic, for it's practical. It's obey because it's obedience. And, it, and it'll work. You understand? In other words, it's not working is not the end, but rather it is obedience unto God being the end, and it may work. It will work. And, and, and because God blesses it to work, but not let that be the end as to why you do it. Because if you do it for that reason, then you won't do it long, right? You'll say, well, this isn't working. I'm not seeing it. I don't see a difference. I'm not seeing a change. Ah, I'll just go back to doing what I was doing. That's not the point. The point is you're doing it out of obedience unto God. You're doing it because God has called for it. Okay? Now, here's the thing. If God has called for it to show him respect, um, to, 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 to love him, to be pure, what is it doing? Why would he call for it? Because it is showing the world something. It is showing the husband something. What is it showing the husband? That God is the object of my highest devotion and allegiance. And what do we call that, folks? Worship. worship. It is the life of worship. It's not just simply an act, okay? We're going to pray, but it is a life that you display, that makes worship, worship, that makes family worship, worship. We see another thought that's happening in this text, and that is that the link between the qualities and actions of a wife and God's pleasure in those qualities and actions. Look, look again at that very text. Um, it says, but let your adorning be the hidden person of the heart with the imperishable beauty of a gentle and quiet spirit, which in God's sight is very precious. Which in God's sight is very precious. And so what does he say? He says, spend more time beautifying what? The inner heart versus the outside. It, 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 listen, it doesn't mean that you don't stop looking beautiful, okay? Because I know some people like to do that too. Well, you know, God doesn't worry about appearance, you know, and rolls in my head, you know, whatever. You better just love me. Uh, I mean, it, doesn't, it doesn't mean that you don't spend time looking beautiful for your spouse, okay? But what it does mean is that you don't spend all your time looking beautiful for your spouse on the outside, but you spend the majority of your time cultivating the inner, all right? And so he's saying cultivate the inner, make it beautiful, make it vivid, make it bright. But then also, he says, adorn yourself with a gentle spirit and a quiet spirit, meaning allow your husbands to lead. Not, not lead with constant, opinionated, harsh rebuttals to every move he makes. I don't know why you do that. What you thinking when you do that? I mean, what are you thinking? Why would you do that? I mean, really, why would you do that? I don't understand why you would do that. My dad wouldn't do that. It, it, it makes no sense. I mean, I told you from the get-go that wasn't going to work. Why did you do that? I, I told you. Didn't I tell you? I told you five times. <laughs> at least five times. I told you when we was at the movies. I told you. Remember, remember when we was on the way to movies? I told you that wasn't going to work. And you still did. Why did you do that? The Bible says in verse in verses that, that attitude that the woman should be adorned with a gentle and quiet spirit, meaning that She's wise, she's knowledgeable, she shares her thoughts with her husbands, but not in a way that demeans him and steals the respect from him that he so desires and so, so needs. Yeah. Amen. Jump in. Because when that happens, then you have what we have now, which is uh, men in the home, but they don't want to leave because they'll get beat to death if they do leave. And so everything is... is, is um, the woman is super and hypercritical of everything that he does and so what that causes him to do is sit back and then you have the kids running around the house you know acting crazy 
and the wife is looking at the husband like, why don't you step in? Why don't you get him? Why don't you discipline him? And then when he does discipline, discipline the kids, then you have her being hypercritical about how he disciplines the kids. You, you're too hard on him. You shouldn't do this. You shouldn't do that. And, and so then when it's time for, for other decisions to be made in the household, you have the super, the hypercritical wife who's sitting back waiting on him. Okay, you want to lead? You're all about leading? Go ahead and lead. Okay, and when he does lead and he messes up, she's sitting there to be hypercritical. I knew I should have, I knew it. I, I told you you should have done it. So if he's, if he's basically standing there and he knows that her foot is sticking out in order for him to make the move only to trip, he's not going to want to make the move. He's just going to sit back. And so then you have this, just a group of men just sitting around, just watching and looking while the wife is driving. She's fought him for the will the whole time. And so when he gives her the will, she's complaining about that. But yet he doesn't want the will because she's going to complain about his driving. So that, that's what that leads to. Amen. Amen. The scriptures say it's better to live on a roof. <laughs> Corner of a roof. Corner of a roof. Amen. Amen. Corner of a roof. Amen. And with a contentious wife. It's, it's, it, 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 it's a tough thing. And so, as she was mentioning, what ends up happening is, again, the leadership diminishes. And you're now, now you're begging for the leadership, and the leadership is not diminished, and it's not there anymore. So you, 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 you do this with a gentle and quiet spirit, loving, compassionate, humble, encouraging. Oh, sweetheart, that's okay. Yeah, listen, listen. We'll, 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 you know, we'll get it next time. You know, you, you prayed about it, you thought about it, you gave good thought to it. You know, I know you value my opinion, but you, you thought that's what, what was going to be best, and so that's the way you went. I understand. All right. So we'll, we'll, you know, we'll, we'll, we'll pick up the pieces. We'll keep moving. And what does that type of conduct lead to, according to First Peter? According to First Peter, this is what he says which in God's sight is very precious. It leads to God's pleasure and delight in you. So, Crawfords, you're suggesting that I respect my husband and my ability to humbly make way for him to lead and my struggle to live with a quiet and gentle spirit all impact worship. Is that what you're suggesting? No, that is not what we're suggesting. We are declaring that. It is a reflection of your worship. Why would Peter say that a husband who does not know God can be won by God by this conduct? Well, and then another question. Why would Peter say that these actions and qualities bring the light to God? Because they say something about God. The display of these actions speak about God. They declare about God. This is a sample of how the life of family worship is truly displayed. This isn't just you doing some, you know, just being morally sound or, you know, I ain't going to just sit back and just be no, no quiet woman. I'm going to say something if I need to say it, right? <laughs> no, this isn't just about you just doing it for the sake of doing it. This is saying something about God. Do you understand that? This is making declaration about God and his nature and his person and who he is and his love towards his people and his relationship with his people. This is saying something about him. Now, before we get too far in this, um, you know, this thing, let's just stop and let's think about how this plays out in the Christian culture. Because um, say we have a husband and a wife who, um, who are both in the faith and attending a particular church, but the wife doesn't care too much for the church, right? And so the wife says, I think the Spirit is leading me to another church. But the husband is saying, I think it's best for us to stay at this church. We're, we're at right now. What is her proper response? How should she respond? Follow her up. Right? Yeah. Why? Because it works? Nope. Because it's worship. 
You understand? It's not simply because it works. Baby, you're still not going to like the church. <laughs> Might be 10 years you still don't like the church. <laughs> but it's not because it simply works, but rather it's because of work. It's because it's worship. And because it will ultimately work at some point in time, if you give your heart to worship, God will account for that. Worship is obedience to God who commands you to follow your husband. Not following a possible unction that you get to go your own direction. You understand that? That is convincing you to part ways. Instead, you should patiently, gently, and submissively share your spiritual concerns. So say, say there's trouble there. Say you're saying, listen, man, I, I think we should go. The verses you just basically say, listen, the Spirit told me to go, so I'm leaving. Share your concerns. Humbly, submissively, gently. Share your concerns. Baby, listen, I got concerns about this. I got concerns about what's happening here. I got concerns about what's happening here. And be patient. And allow God time to shape and mold your husband. Or allow God time to shape and mold you. Because maybe those concerns that you have are products of not his heart, but maybe they're products of yours. And I'm not talking about essentials. I'm not talking about if your husband is, you know, urging you to attend the first, you know, first church of Satan. Uh, <laughs> you know, I'm not pushing for that, okay? What I'm saying, what I'm saying is, is that, you, you, you know, we're talking about non-essentials, and you, you're, you're just basically, yeah, I, don't, I, want, I want them to do this more, I want them to do that more, and, they are not doing that. I don't feel like they're sensitive to the spirit. I'm leaving. I'm talking about that kind of stuff. So likewise, husbands, he then moves the life of family worship to from the husband to the wife. So um, what, is the, what is the sample of, life, of the life of family worship for the husband? He says, likewise, husbands, live with your wives in an understanding way, showing honor to the woman as a weaker vessel, since they are heirs with you of the grace of life, so that your prayers may not be hindered. So Peter, like he does with the wives, gives the husbands instructions by which they are to live in marriage with their wives. He says, live with your wives in an understanding way, or in some, some uh, verse, versions he says, according to knowledge. So, in other, uh, so what does that mean? So live with your wives in an understanding way, or according to knowledge. Primarily it means, I believe, um, and, and, and some people go back and forth on this, but primarily Live according to the knowledge of God's will regarding marriage and regarding your wife, regarding how you should treat her, regarding how you should love her. But also, secondarily, knowledge according to what the wife needs from the husband to grow in values. What does she need from you? So live in such a way where you are first thinking in terms of what is God's will concerning how I relate to my wife and how I love my wife and care for my wife and nourish my wife. But then also live in such a way where I am sensitive to what my wife needs in order to be uh, continuing sanctification. Her needs, as uh, Brother Matt and Sister Jim will share later on. So what does she need to grow in godliness? What does she need to grow in sanctification? The husband should be concerned about that. Do you understand? He should be concerned about that. Not just simply discounting that. Well, oh, you know, she's just always nagging about me not spending enough time with the family. Just nagging, nagging, nagging. I don't know what else she expects me to do. I work, you know, all these hours. I need some time to just kind of kick back with the boys and watch the game. No, be sensitive to her needs. If she needs that, give it. Why? Because it works? No, because it's worship. You understand? Yeah. He then says this. He says, showing honor to the woman as the weaker vessel. And to me, that's like one of the most beautiful verses um, in dealing with marriage relationships and, and husband and wife relationships because to me, that is, that is a verse that is seeking to restore chivalry. It really is. And, uh, among other things. But, in, but, but one thing in particular for me is that it's seeking to restore chivalry. This is to say that the husband should display to the world that the wife is guarded and protected and prized She's covered and nourished, that she's guarded, cherished, she's, she's loved, and she's, she's shielded. 
live with her in such a way as she being the weaker vessel. Display honor to her. Prize her. Prize her. The Bible says a, a, a virtuous woman who can find. Prize her. What do I mean by that? Well, it, you know, it can be it can be subtle things. You open the door for your wife on dates. You just or you just want to make sure she just getting what she fit. Then get in before I leave. <laughs> right? You prize her. Do you cherish her? How, do you do you walk ahead of your wife when you're out in public? How does she catch up? Mm -hmm. Or do you walk alongside her or even possibly walk behind her and guard her? <laughs> you know, some 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 brothers, <laughs> some brothers, <laughs> they might even get snatched in the ball, right? <laughs> they wouldn't even know for like the first 30 minutes. Because <laughs> they're too busy going, you know? They're like 10 feet ahead of her. Wife's in the back, you know. <laughs> Trying to catch up, they go. <laughs> Do you prize her? Do you cherish her? Do you honor her as the weaker vessel? See, many many men like to acknowledge that their wives are weak, but they don't like to honor her as being weak. God calls us to honor her as being weak, meaning that it's not, not just simply acknowledge. Do what I say, woman, because I'm strong, man. <laughs> I mean, that'd be funny, but. <laughs> but, it's ra but it's rather, because I'm strong, because I'm a man, I do everything within my strength to cover her. Mm. I do with ev everything within my power to nourish her. I go above and beyond. When I'm weak, I'm like, listen, I'm supposed to be strong, right? So I'm tired, I'm exhausted. Oh, man, don't feel like doing anything. Wife says, baby, can you go get something to eat? Yeah, let's go. Go and get something to eat. Why? I'm supposed to be strong. See, we like, we like to declare our strength when it's, when it's convenient, right? <laughs> we, but when, when the wife is like, sweetheart, can you? I had a long day of kids. You know, Elijah has been bugging out. Can you, um, can you go get something to eat? Uh, I'm so tired. Just so weak. <laughs> right? <laughs> That, that's what we want. That's when we want to be weak, right? We want to be strong when it's convenient to be strong, and when it's inconvenient to be strong, we like to be weak. That, that's my struggle. That's my that's my that's my fault. God calls me to be strong towards the weaker vessel. He calls me to honor and prize her and cherish her. And that's what that means, folks. That's what that means. I'm supposed to live with my wife in such a way that my, my kids can look at me and they can see in some sense how God loves them. Now, now I'm not talking about perfect sense, okay? But when you look at the Ephesians 5 text, husbands love your wives as Christ loves the church. My children, in their daily interactions with their fathers, should grow some depiction of what it means to love, to be loved by God, by the way their fathers love their wives. You understand? You say, man, that's hard. But it's worship. But it's worship. Anything? Sweet. So, real quickly, uh, as we close, turn to Deuteronomy 6. Uh, so, we'll talk a little bit about the children, and then we'll talk um, just about some practical activities that we do in worship um, and then we'll ask you know open up the floor for just questions that you guys see fit to ask is this helpful at all yes good deal so um deuteronomy 6 um Deuteronomy 6, are we here? Yeah. 
Now this is the commandment, the statutes, the rules that the Lord your God commanded me to teach you, that you may do them in the land to which you are going over to possess it, that you may fear the Lord your God and your son and your son's son by keeping all his statutes and his commandments which I command you all the days of your life, and that your days may be long. Hear therefore, O Israel, and be careful to do them, that it may go well with you, and that you may multiply greatly as the Lord, the God of your fathers, has promised you in a land flowing with milk and honey. Hear, O Israel, the Lord our God, the Lord is one. You shall love the Lord your God with all your heart and with all your soul and with all your might. And these words that I command you today shall be on your heart. You shall teach them diligently to your children and shall talk of them when you sit in your house and when you walk by the way and when you lie down and when you rise. You shall bind them as a sign on your hand and they shall be as frontless between your eyes. You shall write them on the doorposts of your house and on your gates. We don't have enough time to really delve into all the intricacies of that particular passage. But just know this. But the passage is here, pretty clear saying, and deliberately speaking about God's commandments, is that they should be everywhere. God's commandments should be everywhere. This passage is, an, is basically an encouragement to propagate to your children a worldview of Christ, a Christian worldview, where they see the world through the lenses of God's commandments. Not, not just simply, let's go to church. Let's go to church, and um, maybe we'll get some Jesus there. And then we can do our own thing once we get back home. You know, the real stuff. But it's rather, son, do you know, do you know, why, um, you know why I'm asking you to obey me? Because you're dad? Yeah, I'm dad. That's true. But I'm asking you to obey me. Because I'm dad, because God has called me to a special position to oversee. And I have to lead you because that's where your blessing is in. Because that's what God has ordained for us to do. It's the same way dad has to obey God because that is, that is dad's position. To stand before God and to obey him. You understand that, son? No? Okay, we'll talk about it again. <laughs> It's propagating a worldview so that they see life through the lens of Christianity. Because what ends up happening, and, and let me tell you straight up now, and going back to the husbands, for example, notice that, just, just a caveat, notice that 1 Peter 3 and 7, it says that your prayers may not be hindered. Live with your wives in an understanding way. Honor her as the weaker vessel, that your prayers may not be hindered. What's the product of prayers being hindered? Not the product, but what's the root of prayers being hindered? Why are prayers hindered? Anybody? Sin? Yeah, absolutely. But but even but 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 uh, another way of saying that is because God is not pleased, right? And when we talk about the pleasure of God, what are we talking about? <clears throat> Worship. So you say, well, why am I doing this? Why am I honoring my wife? Why am I honoring her as a weaker vessel? Why am I, you know, living with her in a knowledgeable way, in an understandable way? Because it's worship. Because it's saying something about God. And to not do that is saying something else that God doesn't want you to say. Thus, hindering your prayers. But, but back to this example about the children. So, so if I'm just simply the Sunday goer or the person that kind of has Jesus on a shelf, your children know it. They know whether or not Jesus is real in your home. And they might not tell you. They might just wait, you know? Okay, yeah, we'll pray. Fine, that's good. They'll just wait. Can't wait till I get out of the house and stop doing this stupid Jesus stuff. They don't even believe it. Why in the world do we have to do that? And so what you do, because here, here's the thing, what ended up happening ultimately is, you know, um, the children of Israel didn't do that. They didn't, they didn't continue propagating this worldview. And so ultimately the next generation that came behind them just doing whatever they want to do. And so, and so it's not just simply we know God. Because, see, that's, a lot of us grow up on that. We, you know, we know God. We got God in our home. We pray together. And, and no, 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 no. God has to be sent. And everything has to be 
encompassing. And if your children don't see that, then, then it's not real, it's not genuine. And so they'll ultimately just kind of just wander off. So again, it's not just simply an act of worship, but it is a life of worship. What do you say about God and your actions towards your spouse before your kids? What are your kids picking up about God? That's, that's the question you should be asking yourself. When they see, you know, when they see me and Ken interacting with one another, what are they saying about God? What picture do they get about God? When they see me at the store, what picture do they get about God? When they see me on the basketball court, when I'm trying to cheat somebody out of their school, right? No, 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 y'all got y'all got two, y'all got two. Man, we just hit like four points straight. No, y'all, y'all got two. What, 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 what do they say about God then? Your aim and your goal is to project this picture of God. Why? Because it works? No, because it's worship. And it works. That's your duty. That's your goal. That's your aim. Does that make sense? And so it's, it's not just simply living in living in slices of time and picking worship to be just a moment here, a moment there, a moment here, a moment there. But it is a progressive and continuous reflection that God is your highest devotion. He's the object of your highest devotion. And so, you know, what are some acts for, for us, for our family? We can give you guys some things that we do in our time uh, to reflect this thing because the lifestyle again that's why I spent so much time on the life of worship because that's where it has to be had but the acts of worship are what should be culminations of that life it shouldn't be substitutes for the life it should be culminations of the life and so when we talk about the life of worship some things that we do of course is we pray together family that stays together praise God well family that prays together stays together we pray together um, pray with our children Pray with them uh, when they go to bed, and we teach them rich prayers. Um, you know, my, my, my son can barely pronounce the Lord's Prayer, uh, but I taught him the Lord's Prayer um, because I, I, wanted, I wanted him to understand a rich prayer. And then I, I, you know, slowly but surely, we started teaching him what the Lord's Prayer meant so that he would have understanding behind that prayer. And so teach your children to pray, but teach your children to pray with understanding. I encourage you to do that. You know, I mean, it's nothing It's nothing wrong with regimented, routine prayers. I, don't get me wrong. I don't want you to think that. There's nothing wrong with that. But I want you to spend more time incorporating some discussion about the prayer, not just simply praying. Why did we say that, Dad? Right? Give us this day our daily bread. Why did we, why did we say that, Dad? Well, let me tell you why we said that. So prayer is an opportunity for education, spiritual education. Amen? And not just pray with your children, but pray with your spouse. Pray for your spouse. Amen. There's, there's, you know, there's a couple of things that I ask the Lord to, you know, uh, cover my family from in my times of prayer. You know, I pray for my wife and I pray for my children, and I ask Him to protect them from the world, protect them from the flesh, protect them from the devil. I, pr I pray that all the time. Protect them from the world, the flesh, the devil. Guard their hearts. Keep them. Not just simply keep them safe from physical harm, but keep them safe from spiritual harm. I'm far more frightened about spiritual harm than I am uh, physical. So keep them from spiritual harm. Guard, guard their hearts that they may find you if today they find that they crash, that they'll all see you. That's what I'm praying. Amen.